Thank you. Um, first, I want to say uh, that we're very honored and grateful to have Claudio Caldini here as uh, in conjunction with our Contagion Cinema and Media Studies Division Graduate Conference. Um, Claudio Caldini is a major force of Argentine and Latin American experimental cinema and has been for 45 years. Claudio Caldini was an active member of the Cine X group, gathered at the Goethe Institute in Buenos Aires between 1974 and 1983 to promote production, screening, and lecturing on experimental film. Caldini is a dedicated 8mm filmmaker, performance artist, composer, and curator, and he has mentored several young 8mm artists who have gained international prominence over the past decade. His small gauge work is remarkable for its, for its sensuality, intimacy, and precision, and he has collaborated with artists in many media. Following the screening, uh, there will be a moderated Q&A with our uh, Professor David James, who is one of the wonderful professors here in the Division of Cinema and Media Studies. Enjoy. Claudio Caldini. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. And I want to thank the Los Angeles Film Forum and the University of Southern California and also the Getty Foundation for this opportunity of screening my films here. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and also I want to thank Luciano Piazza who organized all the uh, films and uh, the trip for me. And uh, I only, before watching the films, I want to say that there have been a, a, a small change in the program, that the first video of the series uh, that is uh, script as consequencia have changed for uh, heliographia is a video made uh, from eight millimeter films also and uh, I think that the program will be more balanced in that way and uh, I, I I hope you will enjoy it and uh, after the screening uh, I, I will uh, be delighted to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Caldini, please. Thank you, sir, for bringing us such wonderful, magical, marvelous, incredible, beautiful films. It's really a great, great, great pleasure, and it's a great honor, and I'm very delighted I was able to be here. The honor is mine, and thank you. Not, very much. not at all. Uh, they, they raise. When I was thinking about this, I thought um, they raise so many questions, there are so many things to say about them. But at the same time, I think there's so much about them that makes you want to shut up and just be quiet and <laughs> just watch them and think about them. But they do raise so many questions. Um, one thing, I'm going to start, Phil. Is, please sit down. I'll sit down too. Um, I, I hope to get into some more detailed issues, but I thought I'd start out. Is this mic? It's not going. Here, take mine. Uh, with something uh, relatively basic. For me, one of the things I have to thank you for is for obliging us to screen in 8mm. Uh, this is the first time since 1991 that I've seen 8mm film screened in this school. Uh, to me, that's uh, uh, a huge tragedy. Uh, there are so many tragedies attached to this school, but the loss of, <laughs> <laughs> the loss of Super 8 is just the short, thin end of a stick, which means the loss of 60 millimeter, which means the loss of 35 millimeter, which is, I must destroy these, this is not working either, uh, which is also the loss of film. Film has disappeared, and so I was very grateful uh, that you brought us back to film and back to film in its uh, most basic form. Uh, could you could we start then by talking about why Super 8? Was it simply a matter of economics? Yes, it was also economics, but um, 
the, the, the question is that uh, uh, these films represent uh, um, formal experiments that usually can be done on 16 millimeters. Right. But uh, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, 16 millimeters at that time was not easily available for amateurs. And the laboratories doesn't pay many attention to experimental film. And uh, also was very expensive. And I, uh, I prefer to work at home uh, with the instrument I, I know. And uh, still I am working on it. And I, I found that the Super 8 was uh, like a part of my body. And I can do things with Super Ace that which I cannot do with 16 or any other f format. That I was discovering um, slowly as I was using it. And looking back, is this working at all? It is? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, looking back, it seems that the super eightness is essential to their quality, to their rhythm, to their textures, to the light. Uh, also, um, uh, in in terms of being um, a, a cinema without much means, and that and that cinema of poverty, if you like, of amateur, seems to be part of the. Uh, difference they propose against the commercial cinema. They seem to be posited on a human scale and uh, on the tactility of, of dealing with small pieces of film. Exactly, yes, I agree completely. So then what, what is involved in the transition from Super 8 to uh, video, to digital technologies? Was that forced upon you or was that a choice that you uh, readily made? Well, first, I have to deal with the transition to analog video, because in 1986, Super 8 disappeared from Argentina. There was no more laboratories, no more uh, film stock. So I have to change to, to video. And this piece, Heliographia, was made on, uh, do you call it umatic? Umatic? Yes. Yeah. On yeah. videotape. On videotape. Yeah. On videotape. But as I was a uh, Voyager, a traveling person, <laughs> I got super eight in other countries, in France, for instance. Uh -huh. And uh, I traveled to India and worked with another uh, kind of super eight that is called single eight. This is a Japanese system. Uh -huh. And uh, this prisma was made with that format also. And um, I'm working also with digital now, um, but I found that it, it is not. There is no comparison with the frame and the shutter and the surface of the emulsion, and that, that is in, incomparable. But, but you seem to be working to uh, attempt to foreground the qualities of the video medium just as earlier you foregrounded the qualities of the film medium. At first I thought that the heliography film seemed horribly muddy and compared with that beauty of the Super 8, but then you started doing effects with the medium itself which made it uh, a much more interesting, much more exciting. Yes, I changed completely the color, for instance. I, uh, pot I increased the potential. Hmm? Yes, yeah. potential. I increased the color with the um, chroma key uh -huh. and uh, this uh, um, dynamic tracking. And the transfer was not very good. It is not comparable with the digital transfer we have today. Uh -huh. It is just a telecine. Well, I don't want to talk about influences too much, but the only way I can approach your work is via the work with which I'm familiar uh, in the United States. Of course. Um, and to me, what is most remarkable is that you seem to combine two tendencies which in the United States were antithetical. 
On the one hand, your films have this tremendously expressive lyricism, sense of intuition, of not knowing where the inspiration comes from. Then on the other hand, there's this interest in uh, predetermined structures, reflexive things about the medium, making the nature of the medium itself the subject of the film. In the United States, that was a very contested shift, the shift from brackage to structural film. But your work seems to me to be unique and marvelous in that both of these are operating simultaneously. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is real. <laughs> it is real. I, <clears throat> I really don't know sometimes from where my inspiration comes, but I'm very serious with the structural thing. And uh, uh, I have the opportunity of talking with Michael Snow uh -huh. in Toronto. And I, I, I apologize that my film Gamelan looks a little like La Région Centrale, <laughs> but I told him at the time that uh, I don't knew nothing about La Région Centrale in 1981, because there was no internet, no film uh, reviews or some, some information about it in Argentina. And I, I have that this idea, and <laughs> I realized it without knowing nothing about Michael Snow film. But uh, he likes him, the film very much. He did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that, uh, your mention of that film uh, brings me to one thing I think we should talk about a great deal, and that is their relationship to music. Yeah. And your whole relationship to music. I know that you're a musician. You made the music for some of these films yourself and they rely on music. What's interesting to me about Gamelan is that uh, the visual track seems to be this spontaneous continuous pan through a window or something, uh, whereas the music is highly structured and highly segmented. So how do you see those two aspects working together? Well, um, I will start for the title. Uh, today I shall title it uh, Ratio or Tangente, Tangent. Tangent, yeah, because the title is not related to the image at all. At the time I was uh, a bit influenced by, by the work of Bernard Neck, a German filmmaker, mm -hmm. experimental filmmaker, and he was a linguist and was trying to found interesting sound uh, in, in the words, uh, the, the, phonetic, the phonetic of the words, the words, the words. Um, and uh, the only relations, uh, relationship with the title is that gamelan music, it is Balines gamelan music, is uh, structured uh, in uh, and uh, not serious, but uh, phases. Phases. Phases, or uh, um, yes, I don't remember the word now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm, well, doesn't matter. In, in sections, it is a structure in sections. But. Um, uh, for me, the, when I listened for the first time the music of Steve Reich was in a, in a structural film made by an Argentinian lady called Narcisa Hirsch. He made a film um, with uh, his one of his first um, electronic pieces called Come Out, and he she made a film. Uh, on the contrary direction of the music, because she started with a completely out of focus image that slowly, very slowly, is coming into focus. And it was a quite a static film, and I wanted to make an answer to her film, and also uh, choose Steve Reich music uh, for, for this objective. And uh, it is 
also it was like a part of a movement we were making films as as um, as a group we were working together and uh, i wanted to be a part of it and uh, and all the production of the group to be understood as as, as a way of thinking about film what was this the group goethe or the goethe group Yes, it was not named the Goethe at all, but we worked uh, in the Goethe Institute for screenings. Uh, yeah. W were these screenings, in some sense, clandestine? Were they had? Were they secret? Could you have shown them? Publicly? Not completely uh, clandestine, because um, the Goethe Institute uh, uh, also publicly um, screened. Uh, Fassbinder films during the dictatorship, and there was no problem about it. And um, we we didn't have any problem with uh, the dictatorship until the 1993, when uh, another German filmmaker, uh, Bernard Schroeter, came to give a workshop. And in that case, yes, we 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 was amenazados. We were threatened. We were threatened by the militars when he came. Yeah. So, so in that period before 1983, it would have been possible to screen outside the Goethe Institute if there had been a social group interested? Well, there was an amateur of, uh, film uh, society. And sometimes I, I, I went there to screen my films. Uh, my films are quite innocent. And they are not... Uh, Politic, uh, not uh, evident political si significance. Then uh, it, was, it was not danger for us. Uh -huh. mm. And in some of the critical writing about your work, it suggested that there was some degree of hostility between you and what we in the United States know as the Argentinian political avant-garde, Salinas and Gatino and things like that, and that they were. Um, dismissive towards you, is that right? Yes, there uh, uh, were those bandos. There was two groups. Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, we were opposite. We were the static avant-garde and the political avant-garde uh, hate our really? work. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, I'm deeply committed to seeing these films as deeply political. Uh, because for me, they challenge the uh, establishment film industry, the concept of what art could be and should be. Do you share that feeling of their political significance? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are deeply political also. I always say that. Yeah, and in the way of showing the films, and um, it, it is made at, at the measure of man, and uh, in, in the way of creating our own, our own audiences, this is political. Yeah. For me, one of the most magic, well, there are two, fi well, there are several films that are really magical. <laughs> the one called VT of the dog running around the, I mean, that, that's just sublime. That's just fantastic. <laughs> I think that's just absolutely magnificent. But the one that I uh, um, like most of all is the circular screen. Uh -huh. um, w w when I have no idea why that affects me so deeply. Could you talk about what, you're, what you see in that film? That's the one with the in, with the sections of green and the people going through the windows, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, this was a f fantastic moment with uh, two friends of mine in a city in the south of uh, Argentina called Bariloche. It is a place in the mountains, and uh, um, we was taking some tea and uh, we was visiting our friend house with a beautiful garden and flowers and it was uh, springtime and we, we, we feel very very happy at that moment and uh, there was a sort of romance between this couple and I told them well uh, please uh, stay doing these movements for me and uh, I put the camera in this window and um, filmed all 
directions and uh, um, I asked him very, very uh, few things from them just to go to the garden and come inside but without no no more directions at all and um, after that I, I made uh, an installation of loops with it and uh, recaptured the image uh, from the other side I, I recaptured the image from the other side uh, of, of the paper screen, a translucent screen, uh, and I filmed again the, the result from the other side with a super camera. And, um, well, it is, this is one of the films I cannot say from where the inspiration came. <laughs> but I, I will say one thing about the other film of, of this untitled untitled uh, of the dog and the birds and the swimming pool it is that maybe it is a new category of experimental film that's called camera failure <laughs> Uh, so that all that was accidental? Because well, uh, this uh, stop of the movement is completely accidental, but what is not accidental is my uh, obsession of finish the film. Uh, uh, despite the fact despite, that despite of the fact of the camera was failing and I stopped uh, the, the running and I um, beat I beat the camera a little and it is still... <laughs> so, so this is the first accidental structural film. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. That is why the movement it is not fluid and uh, that uh, uh, spots of light can interrupt the, the, the action. You see, I was about to say, in this film, the filmmaker looks back to Georges Méliès and the tricks that you can do with uh, stopping a camera in mid shot. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, while I was sitting there, I was thinking that this situation uh, for us here at USC is both unique and very common. Uh, it's very common that we have visiting filmmakers here to show their work and talk to students, but it's very, very rare that we get a filmmaker as accomplished as uh, Signor Caldini. Um, the other meetings when people from Hollywood come and show their films, they all end with the, or not all of them, but usually they end with the question, what advice do you have for young filmmakers? <laughs> <laughs> and your work is so profound that I want you to give us all the advice you'd give to young filmmakers. I'm not young filmmaker anymore, but, but I'm a filmmaker, but some of these are young filmmakers. So I think we would uh, very much like your advice on that question. Well, uh, forget uh, the, the first. You have to know uh, to know and to dominate the technique, but to forget it also. That is a very the most difficult thing. You have to forget the technique once you you have uh, uh, mastering it. Yeah, that is for me. That's the basic. That's, a, that's the, the, the one lesson which you well, take away. Well, uh, you have to practice always and to throw out everything that is not, uh, that you don't like. I have throw, mm, thrown away to the garbage a lot of footage, a lot. <laughs> that's, that's, that's interesting because your words of advice are exactly the same as Brackage uh, gave. You must learn your techniques then and then forget it. But he never threw a frame away. He always <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I regret to to throw out some footage also. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great. Well, I've had my say. It's your turn. So, if anybody would like to ask questions, please raise your hand. Uh, don't tr try to keep the questions brief, and uh, we'll take it, start out with Jerry. <clears throat> Thank you for showing film I appreciate it and um, could you tell us how much you think of the audience when you're making your film what role do they play in your creative process 
Well, I am a, a very uh, good film uh, spectator. 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 So, so I first I think that uh, if I like what I am doing, some some other people will like also. I, I'm not thinking in um, complacer. Um, Making them happy, making the audience happy. Well, no, yes, I'm thinking of it. But <laughs> just I'm thinking, please help me. Um, sí, I know. Pero bueno, eh. Yo estoy pensando que el público tiene que entrar en otra dimensión. I think in the, to, to, to give to the people another dimension of reality, not only to uh, communicate something, but uh, to, 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 uh, to show them that reality is more complex than uh, we, uh, we always see in the in the Uh, usual film or television, or I, I really want to give them another kind of experience. Expanded consciousness. Of course, yeah, yeah. I don't remember. That. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, so thank you again for bringing your films. I thought they were extraordinary. And um, it's funny that you bring up Michael Snow because I, I think that um, wavelength for me, I think, is something that shows up a couple times in a few of your films. Um, it's sort of in this sort of similar exploration of depth. Um, and I'm thinking of aspirations and also the second one as well. Um, and that seemed to be sort of a recurring theme is sort of exploring various levels of proximity and, and depth. And I was curious if that's sort of a conscious uh, motif in your films. And if so, um, what it is that you're sort of looking for when you're exploring the sort of variance in, in depth, if that makes sense. Well, this uh, first three films is a trilogy about uh, <coughs> animation and meditation. Mm -hmm. Especially the first one was uh, the making was a meditation in itself. And um, I didn't understand the, uh, the second part of his question. What about the, the, the profundity, uh, the deepness? So, the so um, can you repeat, can repeat the, the second part? Yeah, of course. Um, so it just seems like a, a recurring sort of motif of exploring sort of the depth of the frame and how, how far you can push objects into the frame, or how close you can bring them. And I was curious if that is sort of a conscious motif in your work, and if so, what it is that you're sort of trying to look for, I think, when you're sort of playing with that distance um, tw from, um, like to and from the camera. Well, at the time I was very interested in the um, animation of camera parameters. So the f uh, variable focal distance, the focusing and the position. And in that sense, this trilogy means uh, uh, an evolution from something very rigid to something more free. And uh, um, I, I wanted to recreate also this feeling of camera obscura mm -hmm. that in the first is very evident and in the second it became a, a white cube. And there are many ideas uh, around this second film that, because it is also a um, self-portrait and uh, there is some, uh, some ideas of uh, Indian aesthetics about the yantra, you know, that is a concentric uh, design of triangles that represents the unity of uh, uh, the human uh, um, characteristics, like the physical, mental, and uh, emotional, and spiritual. And um, this is also an, uh, an object of meditation. And um, the third is purely emotional, it's, it's a, a devotional feeling. Um, I don't know if your questions were more technical. No, that, that is a perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, yeah, along the lines of the, uh, thank you, um, and along the lines of the uh, devotional element of the films, there seems to be this sort of 
a real feeling of harmony uh, with the, the natural objects that are represented in the first films, like um, both in terms of the music and the, the camera's relationship to them, the people who are represented at times in nature. There, there is a, a deeply harmonious feeling, I think. In the last film, there's suddenly a note of real discord or uh, a change in tone that, that to me was deeply dramatic. I was wondering if you could speak to that at all. Or, um. Well, yes. Uh, this harmony um, needs from uh, needs to, to for, for to to live in that harmony. Uh, uh, you need some isolation, and that is the reason because uh, the. The last films are more dramatic because are more uh, um, made into the real world. World and uh, um, it is the, the, the world is dramatic and from the 70s to uh, today it, it becomes each day more dramatic and uh, more tragic and uh, it uh, that affects me as uh, as uh, uh, all of us are affected by that and um, I always thought in make films with a camera as a direct expression, a direct way of expression without words and uh, that is why each of my films have a, 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 a tone or, or a characteristic uh, mm, mood. Like in, like the music, you know, and that, that there is a chord that is dramatic, and you don't know exactly why when you listen to it, but it, it have the feeling as a contrast of colors. Also, movements and colors in the image are that the way of expression in in film. Thank you. The question? Yes, Alison. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of the uh, the sort of ci the cinema that is not focusing on the word and not focusing on language, and I'm curious to tie this back to the references to Brackage that came up before, and I'm wondering to what extent there is kind of an impulse toward an experience that the spectator might have towards something that is not necessarily privileging the linguistic or privileging kind of the ways that we encounter a more narrative cinema but an alternate mode of experience. Is there that kind of priority in your work, or, um, like, uh... Oh, experiencia algo, or experiencia algo? Oh, experiencia algo. No, no, my, my main purpose is to experience things directly without explanation. And not without words. Words can come after, always come after for me. And uh, I, th I think that it is the meaning of experimental art that you are practicing uh, the testing with the materials and proce procedures and after you know how what have you done, but you have to um, verify the results. Yeah? Did I get to the point of your question? I think I thought your question was something more specific than that, was it? Um, I think a little bit more, but I mean, that's kind of the general outli outlines okay. of it. But, uh, okay. Um, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, as a musician, but someone who brings music in, even from other artists, do you come in from different angles? To putting music in your film or do you look at it a certain way or is it always conceived before you start the film or is it discoveries as you're making the film how do you approach music uh, well it is in each case is different and i have uh, i have a musical formation when i was a child playing piano and uh, i was uh, listening all the history of music from my childhood and uh, um, 
that influenced my way of uh, perceiving the, the world and the, the way of thinking about film. But sometimes uh, the, 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 the music comes first. And uh, after many years of making films, I started to make silent films or to um, avoid to use the same music that I was using when, when I made them. Because it was a sort of uh, um, DJ music, or it, 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 we, we felt that everything should have music in the 70s. And uh, at that time, uh, we was a sort of proto video, music video. And, uh, uh, at, at the time, it, uh, I didn't think too much about it, but in, it was in the uh, 80s when I s stopped making films for s many years and, s and started making electronic music. And um, at the time, st instead of make music for films, I made films for music and to be projected in concert, to be screened in the concert. But now, as you could, uh, could see, I'm making silent films. Uh, Good. Other questions? Comments? Yes. Hello. Um, thank you for sharing your work. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, something connected to the fact that usually in the academia we classify films into these boxes that are documentary, fiction, experimental, and then the genres that come along with fiction and with documentary and with everything. And I was wondering, while I was watching the films, mm, my perception was somehow towards some surreal diary films in a way. But I was wondering, how do you play with that? And how do you play with the idea of a documentaristic perspective or a fictional perspective? Because the experimental term is so wide that it doesn't address uh, the relationship between these fronts. So do you have any, yeah, any thoughts on, on that negotiation? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, there are films that are more pictorial. There are documentaries that are more essays, essay, ensayos. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there are fiction that are, have uh, mm, elements of documentary or vice versa, or even all the all we can all we call experimental film comes from the beginning of film story as a way of altered perceptions of the um, characters. So uh, experimental film is everywhere, uh, as fiction is everywhere, as documentary is everywhere. <laughs> I cannot uh, um, have a determinated uh, answer for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I think we're just about ready to wrap up. And once again, I'd like to thank you very, very deeply for bringing us a wonderful <laughs> 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 <laughs>